Thank you everyone for joining us today. Today's webinar is on the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System, CEUSE. Today, staff from across the Canadian Integrated Ocean Observing System will provide an overview of CEUSE. They're going to explain the benefits for its users and data contributors and conduct a tour of the asset map and data catalog. They will also explore the ways that CEUSE contributes to the FAIR data landscape and highlight some of the anticipated developments to come. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. You might have noticed that you've been automatically muted when you entered the Zoom room today. This webinar is being recorded and the chat may be archived for those who are unable to attend. We do encourage everyone to use the latest version of Zoom so that you have access to all of the features, including security updates. We ask that you use the chat feature if you are having technical difficulties or if you have additional resources to share. We ask that you use the Zoom Q&A option to ask questions of the presenters. Questions will be addressed at the end. You may also raise your hand if you wish to elaborate or ask a question at which point I can give you permission to speak at the end. Questions may also be asked in English or French. We abide by the CARL Code of Conduct. CARL and the Portage Network are committed to providing a welcoming, safe and harassment-free environment for its staff, membership committees and working groups, as well as for participants, speakers and organizers of CARL meetings and events. We do not tolerate harassment of any kind. We'll share the complete Code of Conduct via a link in the chat. A little bit about our presenters today. Beginning with Jeff Cullis, the Technical Director at CUS Atlantic. At CUS Atlantic, Jeff Cullis is the Technical Director working with the technical team on the development and implementation of the data systems and metadata standards that will enable fair data access and interoperability with national and international ocean observing systems. Prior to joining CUS Atlantic, Jeff held positions focused on scientific programming and data management at the BC Cancer Agency and at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Jeff's educational background is in computer science and he holds both an undergraduate and master's degree in this field. Raina Jenkins is, our is the data stewardship manager for Ocean, Network Ocean Networks Canada and CU Pacific team member. Raina Jenkins is the Data Stewardship Manager at Ocean Networks Canada is an, and is an integral team member in the formation and development of CU Specific. She has been closely involved in metadata management, data acquisition, expedition support, and interoperability initiatives at ONC for more than a decade. She is active within the research data management community through working groups and committees, including as a board member for the Core Trust Seal. She received her Bachelor of Mathematics in Applied Mathematics from the University of Waterloo and her Master of Science in Ocean Physics at the University of Victoria. Lydia Ross is the Engagement Specialist at CUSE Atlantic. Lydia Ross is inspired by the opportunity to help advance re regional ocean and data priorities as an Engagement Specialist for CUSE Atlantic. She is energized by the multiplicity of geospatial and information engagement work taking place across the Atlantic Maritimes and her role in helping others realize the full value of their ocean data. Lydia is also the project officer for Coin Atlantic, Coastal and Ocean Information Network Atlantic. She received her Master of Marine Management from Dalhousie University. I'm going to hand things over now to Jeff, Raina, and Lydia. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Melanie, for that introduction. And thanks to Jeff for uh, being our slide master today. No We're problem. so excited to speak with you about CUS and also to learn from you. To do this, we have four polling questions throughout the presentation that we'd encourage you to participate if and able. Um, so just we'd love to hear a lot about what you have to uh, bring to the table today in this conversation. Next slide, please. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I sense that a lot of you today understand the value of open data. We're hoping you do. That way we can move forward together with a shared appreciation for its value as I provide an overview of CUSE, as well as how it benefits the Portage Network community. 
Raina will then guide us through the CS approach to research data management, sharing specific challenges associated with ocean data and metadata best practices and standards. And will prompt us with a word cloud exercise around ocean data granularity. She'll then explain how CEUSE meets the FAIR data principles and will situate CEUSE within an ever-expanding open data landscape. Jeff will take us on a tour of the CEUSE asset map and data catalogs and share developments happening nationally and regionally at CEUSE. I'll wrap up by asking what you want out of your Canadian integrated ocean observing system with one final poll. Next slide, please. So once again, thanks for coming. Before I begin, I'd really like to know who I'm speaking with. Are you an academic librarian, a researcher, perhaps a data specialist, or in high performance computing? Something else? Let us know where you're coming from today. I'm looking forward to seeing all the responses. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll in just a moment and we'll be sharing the results. Thanks, Melanie. Okay, so we have uh, the majority of folks today, 40% of you came uh, from data specialists and the other 40% is other. Um, I wonder who that could be and the remaining 14% from academic uh, libraries and 5% researchers with 2% from high performance computing. So largely other and data specialists. Thank you, Melanie. Next slide, please. Canada has the longest coastline in the world from the Pacific West Coast to the Atlantic East Coast to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, the Arctic and the Great Lakes. The ocean is an important feature of Canada in many ways. The ocean sustains marine organisms that provide us with over half of our oxygen, critical habitat for an amazing array of coastal and, uh, and ocean biodiversity. It mitigates against climate change by absorbing CO2 and provides opportunities for education, research and innovation, and most of all, fills us with inspiration. This is largely only the case, however, if oceans are healthy and functioning. Our healthy oceans contribute over $20 billion annually in economic activity and ocean trade in Canada. From things like commercial, recreational, and Aboriginal fisheries, aquaculture, tourism, transportation, shipping, marine energy, and coastal development. But collectively, these activities are taking a severe toll on our oceans, habitats, and species. Further anthropogenic climate change and rising atmospheric CO2 is warming ocean surface temperatures and increasing ocean acidity. Using an integrated approach is one way to work towards addressing these seemingly competing social, environmental and economic objectives within a shared resource like our oceans. In 2021, we will enter the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, where researchers and stakeholders will, among other things, unite to build a shared information system based on reliable science-based data that, the, that will contribute to a well-functioning, resilient, and sustainable ocean. Meanwhile, Canada's ocean strategy calls for an improved scientific knowledge base for coastal and ocean ecosystems and suggest building cooperation in the monitoring and distribution of information, including traditional ecological knowledge, in efforts to benefit from operational oceanography, defined as planned long-term and routine measurements of the oceans and atmosphere that enable real-time distribution and inter interpretation of information. Next slide, please. While it is clear that researchers need access to high quality, reliable data and information to determine the state of our oceans locally, more data has been collected in the oceans in the past two years than ever before, thanks to thousands of tidal buoys transmitting temperature, salinity and current speeds every minute, as well as other platforms and instruments. 
Let's not forget about the existing ocean and coastal data scattered across external hard drives, thumb drives, desktop computers, or filing cabinets, and if lucky, accessible through a generalist data repository. We feel that unless data can be shared, its full value cannot be realized. Yet sharing data is not enough. The data must also be properly managed so that researchers can reuse that information to create a more comprehensive picture of our oceans. Next slide, please. The Ocean Data Management Community of Practice rose to this great challenge beginning in 2014 by developing the vision and investigative reports for a nationally coordinated ocean data management system for Canada. In 2018, we finally joined the international stage of ocean observing systems pictured in this map as phase one of the Canadian integrated ocean observing system. Next slide, please. CIUS is a national collaboration to share, discover, access, open ocean and coastal data and information available in English and French to help us better understand and respond to the state of our changing oceans. CIUS works across sectors to bridge the knowledge expertise as well as digital and monitoring infrastructure of Canada's ocean observing community. One national and three regional portals provide free and easy access to ocean and coastal information available as raw data and visualized on our asset map. CIUS makes data discoverable and accessible by using internationally recognized data standards and digital infrastructure. Three regional associations based in the Pacific, St. Lawrence, and the Atlantic work with their local oceanographic communities to prompt collaboration across ocean sectors and respond to the information needs of the data users and the decision makers who require that data. CIUS also respects the principle of a hahawana, a formal recognition by the ocean observing community of the traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples as being uniquely different from Western science. CIUS recognizes indigenous rights holders as original ocean observers and stewards of important place-based knowledge. Finally, CIUS is funded by Fisheries and Oceans Canada and the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction and Response Network, or MEOPAR, and is currently in phase two of development. Next slide, please. There are a number of benefits and, uh, for data providers and data users of the CIUS platform. At the heart of CIUS are ocean observations. At present, CIUS accepts six essential ocean variables, or what we call EOVs. These EOVs, such as currents, temperature, oxygen, sea height, nutrients, and salinity, measure and track the ocean's health, kind of like taking the ocean's pulse. CIUS is always working to expand its list of EOVs to integrate even more variables into our ocean platform. CUC's value providing a disciplinary repository through our team's focused understanding of the breadth of incoming data sets that, while plentiful, can make use of advanced search filtering, recognize data standards, as well as developing APIs and visualizations. Our regionally based engagement teams are keen to help researchers integrate their data into the CU system or support those who assist ocean and coastal researchers in the curation of data by providing tools that support the creation, maintenance, use, storage, sharing, and reuse of ocean and coastal data. Contact your regional association in the Pacific, Atlantic, or St. Lawrence through our websites to discuss your ocean and coastal data needs. CIUS has data integration tools such as metadata profile entry forms, as well as storage, distribution, and long-term storage options to serve those needs. Data integrated onto CIUS is standardized through our CIUS metadata profile, offering rigor in the data quality. These standards are interoperable with the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOSE. Increase attribution of your work using our standard license agreement, CC BY, that requires users to provide attribution, a link to the license, and indicate whether changes were made. CIUS asset map and data catalogs allow users to get informed about who is collecting what ocean data and where. Information provided about the data set allows users to quickly determine if the data is right for reuse. 
Discovering and accessing open ocean data on a single portal saves time of searching through multiple portals for resources, reduces the chances of duplicated collection efforts, optimizes opportunities, and ultimately saves money. Finally, and importantly, CUs can increase opportunities for revalidation, comparisons, and novel data combinations, enhance geospatial data literacy, and provide researchers with an innovative way to share data, information, and knowledge openly and sooner so that their work can inform decisions in near real time. Next slide, please. So enough about us. We want to hear more about you. Please tell us what brought you to this webinar today. Was it out of general curiosity? Do you work with or support coastal and ocean researchers? Are you an ocean or coastal researcher? Did you come to learn about the CU's data management approach? Understand the value of a domain specific repository? I'm going to close the poll in just a moment. We're hoping we were able to anticipate what you came to learn, but I am very curious to hear it from you. Okay, so it's a nice even mix, sort of. We have 50% of those came to learn about the CU's data management approach. Well, that's great. We uh, anticipated that one. I work with or support coastal and ocean research. So not necessarily you're a researcher, but those uh, uh, data librarians and, and data specialists who work with and support uh, researchers. 23% of you said general curiosity and tied at 11% for you are a researcher and to understand the value of a domain specific repository. Well, thank you for sharing those thoughts with us. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'll step in now um, to talk about our research data management approach. Um, so this is one of the kind of classic diagrams um, of a flow of research data from the acquisition of the data to manipulating and working with the data, uh, making sure it's archived properly, um, compliant with any standards and or internal um, practices that um, repositories have, and it will ultimately comes back to um, kind of planning and re planning um, as needed. And so, um, next slide. So as we go about capturing all this information, um, we're looking to figure out um, all along which are the appropriate standards and implementing them as we go. So from the very get-go, we decided, of course, that the ISO 19115 would be our metadata standard for um, our catalog. Um, this we are basing on um, we have a first initial profile, which we worked together on over the first year or so of phase one. And now we're working on uh, a version two. So the version one um, allows us to make sure that we represent um, data sets that come from instruments specifically at this point uh, and congruent with the essential ocean variables, which uh, Lydia highlighted um, in one of her slides that we're currently supporting. Um, in the version two, we're looking at increased guidance for some of the persistent identifiers. We're, we're not yet requiring the persistent identifiers, but we're definitely recommending them and will hopefully evolve to a required situation. Um, as well as we're looking at adding in support for different additional sources in version two. And this will be an ongoing process as we um, widen our scope of what kind of data sets we're including within CUSE. Um, so within uh, that, those metadata are shared via a CCAN server. Uh, we have a customized configuration that's been developed across uh, the CUS landscape. Uh, we're fine tuning it continually as we're looking at different ways we might need to filter um, or leverage content from our, uh, the XML um, that's underlying those records. Um, so, so right now we do have a functional system out there and just going to kind of continue to evolve as we realize um, more features that we need. Um, 
While CCAN is our platform for the delivery of the metadata records, um, the data itself is available through um, an ERDAP server system. This is usually a system that's uh, only mainly used within the climate and oceanographic uh, domains, um, but it's following a standard of OpenDAP protocol and it allows researchers to get the data in formats like NetCDF, which are non-proprietary and standardized. Um, so we're all uh, using these ERDAP servers and that ERDAP, the link to the ERDAP data is available through the um, metadata record uh, as well as the CCAN um, configuration landing page for each data set. So um, that's, that's in action. Uh, we also are being very mindful of interoperability and using um, control vocabularies and uh, recognized approaches to representing the, the content within the metadata record. And so um, I've listed here some of the oceanographic domain vocabularies which we are using. These happen to all be vocabularies that are available through something called the uh, NERC 2.0 web server, that, and which is a web server of vocabularies maintained by the British Oceanographic Data Center um, and widely used within the oceanographic community. We are also working to create a brand new vocabulary within that server that will help us better articulate the specifically um, sea use essential ocean variables uh, that we're planning to use that will help with our filtering and, dis and discovery capabilities. Uh, we've, we're also adopting, uh, so these are in the works, uh, ISO 19157, which is uh, the metadata, um, the way to represent the data quality information within the ISO 1915 metadata record. Uh, so this probably won't make our version two profile, but it will uh, hopefully make the version three or soon after profile, um, hopefully within the next year. So this will be a way for us to summarize the quality information that's in the data. The data policy we're even actively working on, we're looking at using, um, we've been using the CORTRA seal requirements uh, for data repositories as our guiding principles about how we um, define and articulate what needs to go in our data policy. Uh, at this point, uh, it's not anticipated that all of the uh, CUs um, regional associations will be uh, core trust seal certified, although that's uh, ho anticipated for hopefully the future. But this allows us for us to have that construct and to, to kind of self uh, analyze where we are and, and how far we need to go to, to reach that level. Uh, our plans are also to create a template within the DMP, the Data Management Plan Assistant tool that Portage Network has um, put out. Uh, this will allow us to better um, facilitate the data ingestion processes from partners um, that would like to have their data sets within the CUS environment. Um, and so this is an active process within this current phase that we have underway for CUS uh, to work with more additional data partners and, and to better structure the uh, ingestion mechanisms. Another big part of the active phase that we are in is increasing our support for biological data. So this makes, makes us have to look at uh, supporting the standards for the ocean biographic information system. And so this is an active activity that we have underway as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there's been a number of challenges that we have either worked through or are working through. Um, so one is bilingual support. Um, we are working with the different um, um, options for either automated and manual translations. Automated tools are a little bit challenging with such domain specific language like for abstracts uh, and data set titles with instrument names and place names and uh, sp specialized terms for oceanographic research. And so um, while we are working a little bit within automated mode at most of the regional associations, we are also having to figure out better ways to vet those translations and or tweak them with manual interventions. Um, but this is going to be something that we have to look at um, further for better um, to refine our workflows. But this is something, um, this is something if anyone has suggestions, um, we're definitely open to. Uh, we've also done a lot of investigation and discussions around the concepts of granularity, both for individual data sets and ways to aggregate data sets into collections. Uh, so we'll have a little bit of a poll um, after this slide and the next slide um, to try and uh, gather some feedback from, from you all, as well as to kind of share some of these 
um, constraints and ideas around data granularity. Uh, we are also working on figuring out how to best represent data provenance and the quality information. I mentioned the ISO 19157, so that's, that's the standard, but then we of course have to figure out how to represent the content in a consistent way. Uh, for data provenance, uh, we um, might look at options like the W3C prov model, um, but certainly we do need to make sure that we're making allowing end users to understand how the data were processed uh, up to the point that they're receiving it. Um, we are also uh, made sure that our first version of the profile was as compatible as possible with the North American profile. Um, this is mainly motivated by our relationship with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, which do have a mandate to support the Federal Geospatial Platform with that profile. Um, and we don't want to, them to have to do too much duplication of effort for CUs and for the Federal Geospatial Platform separately. However, um, we can't be 100% compatible at this time since uh, the NAP as it exists is um, in an older version of the ISO standard. Uh, we're also working um, in to improvements on our relationships between the metadata records, which are in the CCAN, uh, the data sets there in ERDAP, and the CUs asset map. So um, this will allow for better discoverability, um, filtering, sorting, um, these kind of features as we learn what's needed by the end user community um, better. We're also uh, working to, uh, we also have a challenge because some data types uh, that we're looking to the future to start to integrate uh, don't necessarily have mature or existing community standards. So this will help, this will might limit some of what we can ingest immediately, um, but we'll certainly be prioritizing and figuring out what types of variables and types of data sets um, we can ingest at this point in time, as well as what we really need to figure out um, down the road. Uh, there are efforts internationally on a lot of these newer data types, and so we're definitely um, making sure that we're a part of that initiative as well. Uh, approach to uh, how do we go about publishing our profile is another discussion point. So um, we've looked around at what other groups are doing. Um, there's different like PDFs and things. Some are published on Zenodo, some are uh, published in other places. So we're looking at um, how exactly is the best way to make our profile available in a public uh, forum as well as with proper identification. Uh, with all these diverse data sources, I know it's still the oceanographic domain, but we, there's a lot of different ways that data can be collected as well as the data types that they represent. So this is a challenge. Um, right now we're limited to um, an initial set of variables from phase one, uh, which Lydia posted, but as we expand, we're going to have to be really thinking um, how, how to fit those in. So we have mainly support for the instrument-based measurements, like I mentioned, but we're now starting to uh, we'll look at some of the physical samples which are needed. Uh, and then as we go on, we'll be starting to look at model outputs and other kinds of data such as um, human or machine observations. Um, there's also sensitive data concerns. So right now, all of the data that we're making available through CUS is um, open data and not, uh, not dealing with these kinds of sensitivities. But as we move into more partnerships with say, um, the First Nations communities will have to um, abide by some of the principles that we've been learning through the First Nations OCAP training and other, um, other best practices that are out there, as well as we do have to think about some of the endangered species considerations as we get into more of the biological data. Um, and also, um, if we're depending on the data types, some data types are sensitive to, to military restrictions that we need to consider as well. Next slide, please. So this is where we dive a little bit deeper into the data granularity question. Before I activate the poll, I just want to explain the question a little bit. So the question is going to, that you're going to see is what are the best attributes for aggregating oceanographic data sets? And in that, um, we're thinking about once you have a data set, which we've defined currently as one deployment of one instrument, um, you might want to collect different deployments of instruments together to make collections for easier discoverability, access, um, or other uh, purposes. So um, 
I'll just give a couple examples of that because I recognize not everyone here is necessarily from the oceanographic domain, just to kind of articulate what I mean here. So if you have a deployment of an instrument that measures temperature in the ocean and you deploy that for a year and then you've recovered it, that's one data set. Um, but there's different other attributes to that data set that you might want to um, associate with other data sets. For instance, there may be other instruments that were deployed on the same platform. Um, there might be other instruments deployed on the same expedition, maybe not all the same site. Uh, there might be um, a replacement temperature sensor that replaced the one there and you might want to uh, connect up the different deployments of the same instrument type over time. There might be a project that's associated with the instrument. So there's all different ways that you can package up. And so what we're, we have, while we're trying to have all the metadata in an individual record, we're trying to look best at how to um, package up into collections that might make sense uh, to our end users. And there, we get different answers um, wh wherever we go. Um, and so um, this is just a poll to kind of get a sense of maybe what this community might have um, in mind for that. So I'm going to activate the poll. And so when you go to Slido with the event code 93838, um, you should be able to start um, entering attributes that may allow us to group data sets together. So I'll just give a couple of minutes. Jeff, you can share also that uh, other um, view. Okay, you can see why it's difficult <laughs> to, to, to have standardized approaches to um, representing aggregate data set collections. Um, I mean, location here is a very common one uh, that comes up for us as well. Um, time, um, I'm not sure exactly what that is meaning uh, in terms of, but maybe just a way of discovering data available at a given time. Um, Interoperability, I'm not 100% sure what that means as a way to group um, data sets together, but maybe it just means that they're compatible data types or compatible data formats. I'm not 100% sure. That's definitely a constraint in how you can aggregate the data sets. Um, expedition, geographic location, um, variables. Yeah. So we definitely have a filtering mechanism for the essential ocean variables. Okay, I'm seeing all kinds of words here, which I'm going to close the poll now. Um, and we'll kind of use that as our input. So thank you very much. And so just to just break that up a little bit. Um, when we do, when we go about how we define our data sets, um, while we've figured out our recommended guidance for one individual data set set as one deployment of one instrument. We still have to think through what is one data set when we're talking about um, data that comes from physical samples, like a water sample, a rock, or um, a biological specimen. Um, how do we deal with model data outputs? 
how do we deal with observation-based data sources like um, observations of whales or observations of organisms in undersea video or in hydrophones. So we're going to have to be thinking about how do we uh, represent those as individual data sets. But then also when we aggregate, we need to think about what's best serving our users for discoverability and access. Um, because each, you know, you get and quickly get to hundreds and not thousands of data sets um, individually. And so we need to figure out these aggregate solutions. Um, so discovery and access for the users, um, as well as interoperability. So you can't just simply, um, not all data types are easily meshed together. Um, so we're constrained a little bit by the architecture of say ERDAP or whatnot to define these aggregations of data sets. Uh, so that's something we, we need to think through. And also we need to think about citability. So who, is, who deserves the attributions for the given data set and um, how does that impact uh, the aggregate? So we're looking at all these types of constraints when we do this and, and to optimize it, but sometimes they're conflicting. <laughs> Okay, next slide. So I think everyone here is well aware of the FAIR principles, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, so here I'm mainly just pointing out the ways that CUS is working to be FAIR. We're not quite FAIR compliant 100%, um, but for the findable aspect, we do have our metadata available through the CCAN catalog. Uh, we are uh, supporting of identifiers in our version two of the profile um, and moving towards hopefully requiring them. Uh, and, and our metadata records are becoming increasingly rich as we make the profiles uh, more comprehensive. Uh, the accessibility is uh, standardized through the metadata protocols available through the CCAN server as well as the data delivery through the ERDAP system or OpenDAP. Uh, for interoperability, we're of course using these uh, controlled vocabularies. The formats are standardized both for the data and the metadata, and we're using non-proprietary uh, formats um, for throughout. We're also recommending uh, data licensing being CC BY, although this cannot be necessarily applied for all data sets that enter CUSE, but this would be our recommended default. And we're using community best practices from the oceanographic domain where we can. Next slide. So just to point out, we're, we're CUSE, and this is already a big effort to, um, to work together across the country on our disparate um, data sets. Um, but we also have to be mindful of the broader international community as well, and um, the specific subdomains uh, that we're trying to serve uh, within our data set. So we're looking to be interoperable as much as we can with broader Goose. Um, the Goose itself does not have standardized metadata or data delivery solutions. There are standardized um, essential ocean variables, uh, which are recognized, but the broader um, global system doesn't have metadata and data standards that are being set at this point. Um, with the you, our partners in the United States, they have the Integrated Ocean Observing System, and so we're also um, being mindful of compatibility in that case because they're our closest neighbors. So we have attended um, workshops together with them and are using similar architecture, although not exactly the same, but we do have a lot of similarities um, in the data and metadata that we're, uh, we're serving. As we move forward in this phase, like I said, we're going to be um, uh, incorporating the ocean biogeographical information system uh, formats and so those records will end up also being served and contributed through uh, that framework as well. We, we are also looking to integrate more uh, glider data sets in phase two so we have we are working to follow along what's happening in the ocean gliders Canada community and also the broader international ocean gliders. Uh, where they're working on efforts to make international standards for glider data and metadata. There's also been discussions with our, within Canada for uh, hosting some of the data for some of the regional associations within, the, within FURTER. Um, and those uh, conversations are going well and hopefully we'll start to have some um, data sets being uh, served and stored that way too. So I think that's it uh, for my slides.
All right, so uh, thanks, Reina. I'll just uh, continue on with a uh, brief tour of uh, the CUSE uh, platform. So uh, just switching over now to the main uh, CUSE.ca website. Um, so yeah, first I'll just kind of go through things, um, show what our, sorry, one second. Uh, just show what it looks like from the perspective of a, of a user of, of CU's data. Um, and I'll use CU's Atlantic data set as an example of that. Uh, then I'll show a couple of sort of specific data products and uh, visualization tools that have been developed in the Pacific and uh, St. Lawrence regions. Uh, and then finally, I'll kind of briefly discuss uh, the process for integrating data sets from your organization uh, into CU's. So just starting off from the perspective of a user of CU's, so you come to CU's.ca, uh, you'll see that there's um, sort of this map here. Um, so initially there won't be anything on the right. Uh, there's a sort of base layer that you can change back and forth between OpenStreetMap and a bathymetry uh, based one. Um, and uh, so this is actually called, uh, known as the asset map. So it will show uh, all of our data assets uh, across the country. So just to pan out here and uh, at the top, you'll notice there's these um, various different categories of the essential ocean variables that Lydia touched on earlier. So uh, if you click on physical, uh, you'll come, you'll be able to, you'll see a number of physical attributes that you can choose. So you'll notice if you click temperature, you'll, you'll suddenly see uh, data assets sort of populated across the country. Uh, and uh, you know, there's 104 total data sets there. Um, and then if, as you add more of these uh, options, variables, uh, you'll see that number increase. So that just kind of keeps adding on uh, additional data sets that have additional variables. There's a couple of data sets here in the middle of the country. That's just kind of a clustering issue there. You know, there's components on both coasts. So uh, um, uh, rest assured, it's all uh, ocean data. Um, so yeah, that's the asset map. Um, and uh, you know, if you click any one of these points, it'll kind of focus over on that. You'll see uh, a title, uh, the categories. So this one contains uh, oxygen, for instance. Um, and then you'll see a description of the data set, kind of long form written abstract about uh, how it was collected, what instruments were used. Then there's the CCAN link that uh, uh, Reina had discussed, uh, our CCAN uh, backend for that. Um, so I won't go too much into the CCAN at the moment, but uh, I just wanted to mention, you know, we see all these hundreds of data sets on the map, um, but we aren't actually con collecting uh, data ourselves. So we're, as mentioned, helping increase the findability and accessibility of all the ocean data uh, in our region. Um, and these are being actually federated up uh, using CCAN from each of the regional associations. So if you want to find out more about those regions, just click over to the region section, you'll see the exact areas that are defined for each of Pacific, St. Lawrence, uh, and Atlantic. Um, so to, to look a little more at how that federation kind of works, uh, we can bring temperature back up and uh, say we zoom in over on the Atlantic region, uh, you'll see there's a, a, a buoy there uh, based close to Halifax, Herring Cove. And uh, so this has, a, again, the long form description um, and, and link to CCAN. So if we click in and, and look a little bit at the data catalog for that, uh, so, so you'll see where this uh, description is coming from. You'll also see that for, for at this level, it's attributed to CUSE Atlantic. Um, so if you were to visit this uh, page, you'll get taken over to uh, the CUSE Atlantic site, which uh, other than the banner at the top, which is advertising this webinar, uh, normally would show the asset map uh, again. Uh, as the first thing that you would see on entering the page. Uh, the difference here though, is that when you zoom out, you'll notice that you don't have data from across Canada. It's just the data that's coming from our region and that's federated in from the actual users within our region uh, into our, uh, our regional platform. Um, so yeah, and, and again, when you, you know, you'll see, I guess that, uh, you know, now we've got kind of the CU's Atlantic theme and our, our somewhat distinct logo. Uh, with different colors. And uh, you can click back to that same buoy, find that a lot of the same information is there. Well, all exactly the same information is there. Um, but you'll notice that when you go into CCAN, it's now attributed to Smart Atlantic, which is the original provider of the data, um, which is an, is an alliance um, based uh, mainly out of uh, Memorial uh, University uh, and the Marine Institute. 
Um, and so that is um, um, promoting the operational efficiency, situational awareness and safety in the marine environment uh, and includes a lot of uh, a, a sort of a, a coalition of uh, buoy data there. Um, and uh, I know we're getting close to time, so I'll try and quickly run through some of the metadata features that are here. But uh, in addition to the description, there's also uh, the Creative Commons license that uh, Reina had mentioned. Um, so that is uh, pretty much unrestricted, except for you must give attribution. So you're free to adapt and share the data. Uh, as Reina mentioned, there's ERDAP used to actually get to the data itself. So I won't click this link, but if you were to go there, you'd be able to take a subset of the data that you'd like uh, based on time or variables of interest. Uh, and then pull it out in, in net CDF format or CSV format or a wide range of other formats um, and pull that down. Um, and also both CCAN and ERDAP have fairly extensive APIs. So uh, anyone who's a programmer can uh, use those to pull the data down and, and rerun visualizations, uh, custom visualizations uh, of interest to them. Uh, then there's some date information about when the data was collected. Uh, and then here we have under the metadata source tab, uh, a link to the XML, uh, where uh, we're essentially building these for each one of our data sets and then harvesting them into CUs. And that's where all of this metadata that you see within this CCAN record uh, comes from. Um, so it has all these uh, keywords. There's quite a number for this data set, uh, another geographic representation. And then down in the additional information, you'll see uh, some of the sea surface height, temperature, and currents. And these are actually the essential ocean variables for CUs that are used uh, for filtering in our asset map to show, you know, when you click those buttons, uh, which data sets pop up. Uh, you'll also find attribution information. So this came from Smart Atlantic as well as from Cove. Uh, and then you'll have the full latitude and longitude information and Finally, one thing to highlight down here is the uh, citation identifier. Right now it's uh, UUID, but we are looking at expanding that out to a full uh, citation that uh, anyone who's using the data can go back and, and fully cite the original author of the data uh, using that string. So that is, uh, that is coming. Um, so yeah, just to touch quickly on a couple of other tools. So uh, in St. Lawrence region, uh, they have, uh, um, built a number of additional uh, visualization tools on top of on top of CUs uh, in addition to CUs. So uh, one of these I wanted to highlight quickly was their uh, marine conditions application. Um, so as you see, most of the data there is from the uh, Gulf region. They have weather stations, uh, uh, buoy data, as well as tide gauges. So a lot of uh, real-time observations coming in through this platform. Uh, and the nice part is you can sort of click on one of these assets and you can kind of get a quick plot of, uh, of the data that's available there. Um, and, uh, you know, clicking on a, a buoy, for instance, you can switch over to the uh, water temperature if you want to see what that looked like for the past while. You can change the range uh, and it has many other features. So this is kind of a general um, uh, real-time data visualization platform. Um, it's quite general. Um, and if you were to visit now to switch over to uh, CU specific, uh, so they, again, if you were to go to their main website, you'd again see the, uh, the asset map showing data just from their region. Um, but under the applied data tab, they have this uh, sort of targeted data, data product. So this is very specific to, to one particular uh, user, one, one, one specific provider and, and, and user category that they wanted to target, which was uh, shellfish aquaculture. Uh, looking at um, uh, oysters in particular. So uh, they found, I guess, through the literature review that temperature, pH, and calcite saturation were really important metrics for that. So they built this dashboard to kind of show when things were in healthy or potentially unhealthy territory for, for that aquaculture operation. Um, so they could really kind of make it a nice visual appealing tool uh, with that dashboard at the top. And then uh, you know, fuller graphs of each one of these variables uh, down below that you can again kind of zoom into a region uh, and uh, uh, check out, you know, a specific area of interest to you. Um, so then they have some more information about some of the real-time observations, the the tool, the Berkelator system that was used to, to gather a lot of this data. Uh, and you can actually go into this threshold details and find out more about the, uh, uh, you know, sort of full um, literature on the subject of uh, where they got these 
uh, metrics from and, and uh, how these variables in particular were important for, for that aquaculture project. Um, so yeah, just to go back briefly to um, CUS Atlantic. Um, so for those who are interested in, you know, recapping some of this information, we have information on our website about uh, the essential, essential ocean variables. I think all of our sites have information about all of our partners uh, who work with us to, to create all, to allow all, the, all this to be possible. Um, and, uh, and the last thing I wanted to touch on here was for, for uh, not users, but uh, people looking to provide data, uh, to contribute data, there's some information uh, on, uh, under under that uh, tab, and uh, um, essentially the process it's not really a one click process yet. So you kind of click the data contributor form, enter some of your contact details, um, you know, give a, re a quick recap of the type of uh, data you're looking to contribute, multimedia and other files that are present, um, the size of your data, whether it's historical or real time, uh, the formats that you're uh, of of your data and uh, maybe links to associated metadata, although we'll, we have additional forms, as Raina mentioned, to uh, collect a lot of that information. Uh, and uh, crucially, whether your data is currently accessible online. So as mentioned, we're, we're kind of using tools that federate like ERDAP uh, and, and CCAN to kind of link out to external providers, bring their data in uh, that way. So if you have it publicly accessible online, that really helps uh, ease the transition into CUs and, and make it findable through, through our platform. Um, so I know we're over time now, but uh, just to go back quickly to the slides to uh, um, look at phase two. So what's coming up for CUs? So, you know, in phase one, we kind of got the whole system, the whole platform uh, up and running. We got uh, a number of initial data sets in place, uh, but we're really looking now that we've got that, that done to uh, integrate a lot more data sets from uh, many, many new providers as well as existing providers. Um, Integrating OBIS, you know, biological data is going to be really important for phase two, uh, as well as other EOVs uh, like pH and microplastics and so on. Um, we're going to be improving our infrastructure. We're going to be developing more of those targeted data visualizations. Uh, although we're interested to know if people are, are more interested in uh, more general purpose visualizations like the marine conditions where you, you know, have a, a simplified uh, visualization for, say, real time data that uh, can be used uh, CUs wide. So those are kind of our two options, but we're looking now at uh, more targeted data. We're also looking to improve our whole data integration process. So adding more um, documentation, um, you know, improving some of the tools that we have for, for data providers to, uh, to make that uh, transition over their data and, and figure out how to transform it into a, um, formats and uh, metadata formats that, uh, that we can work with. Um, and then we'll be, uh, looking to improve our user experience, uh, user interface, and uh, mobile uh, experience. So, um, you know, trying to optimize all those things. In terms of outreach, we're going to continue to engage with federal, provincial departments, uh, industrial groups, indigenous communities, uh, academic providers. And uh, in terms of communications, um, the communications team is working on uh, promotional material and, uh, uh, you know, promoting us on social media. The national web presence is is conducting a thorough sort of user feedback uh, uh, report to uh, figure out which improvements to implement next to kind of improve the overall look and feel and, and utility of, of our website and, and, and the tools that we have. Uh, and then we'll be, they'll also be looking at a stakeholder engagement, including uh, uh, the communications plan. Finally, the uh, data stewardship node. Uh, is going to be really focused on uh, in phase two on biological data, genomics uh, as well, uh, as well as uh, easing some of that interoperability for uh, international uh, connections, such as Goose, IUS, and uh, some of the others that uh, uh, Reina had also mentioned earlier. Regionally, uh, you know, we're we're mostly in alignment on on a national. Um, Front, but uh, I think each region also has specific areas that they're they're interested in exploring. Um, so for Atlantic, we're looking uh, strongly at, at integrating at least six new data providers, uh, as well as holding two data provider workshops. Um, working very closely with uh, a number of indigenous communities in our region, uh, and we are looking in the second half of phase two at uh, integrating uh, glider data into the system. Um, in the St. Lawrence region, uh, they have extensive biological data in place from you know uh, previous holdings, uh, and so they're going to build on 
and improve the uh, sort of extend the uh, biological EOVs, uh, as well as developing specialized visualization interfaces. And Pacific is planning to hold 10 site visits with data providers and users, uh, hold five data provider workshops, and uh, as well as integrating ocean model outputs and additional EOVs that are of specific interest in their region. And I think now I'm passing it back to Lydia. Thanks so much, Jeff. We've thrown a lot at you today. Thanks so much for hanging in there till the end. We've got one final wrap up question. As you can see, CU staff are pulled in a lot of different directions and we truly want to build a system that works for you. So you've heard a, a bit about where we're planning to go in our efforts in phase two, and we want to know what resonates with you. What would optimize your chances of either using or referring CUs to your colleagues? Is it tools that support data integration into CU's data standards? Or perhaps tools that support data management more generally? Tools for authoring metadata? Similar, but specific enough that I've made it its own option. What about tools that support visualizations or tools for long-term storage? What message resonates with you? We'll try and work to meet that need in phase two. I'll close the poll in just one moment. Okay, thanks, Melanie. So the majority of you felt that tools that support data management more generally uh, with a close tie to tools that support visualizations and the integration of uh, data into CU standards. And then with a last uh, tied, once again, uh, tools for authoring metadata and tools for long-term storage. So all of those are in the works, um, but this is really good to know where the uh, specific interests lie. So thank you so much, everyone. Next slide, please. If you have any questions, I see we have three here uh, in the Q&A as well as one in the chat, but we look forward to answering any questions that may arise as after today's webinar. So please don't hesitate to reach out. We'll put you in touch with the right team member and uh, we look forward to working together into the future. Um, I guess we'll take questions now. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Lydia, Jeff, and Rena. Um, so our first question today is, how do you or do you work with the Open Government Portal? Uh, yeah, so we are working a little bit, if you're talking about the uh, federal uh, open data portal, so that's, um, yeah, we are getting a little bit of data from, from that source. Uh, we are trying to stay close in our metadata profile with, uh, with their, their metadata profile. So they're both, both based on ISO 19115. Um, so we found it's a fairly easy transition between what uh, is on the open data portal and, and uh, what's in, in the CU's profile, of course. So it, it's fairly easy to interoperate between those two places. And, and uh, since that is all sort of shared, uh, totally accessible online, it's very easy to uh, bring it into uh, the CU's platform. Great, thank you. And our next question, um, can you give an example of the data types that don't yet have a community standard? So from the community, we, uh, Mike Smith has answered data, but microplastics is a current top of mind example. Are there other examples of data types that don't yet have a community standard? Uh, I know there's a number, um, if you look at the Goose website, um, such as I think there's things like mangrove cover, and uh, there's a few that are kind of experimental that uh, may not be as well defined yet, but uh, Raina might know more about that. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I was starting to type an answer, but I'll just answer it uh, here. Um, while a lot of the physical oceanographic variables tend to have um, quite good standards. There's still a lot of standards that are kind of missing, as, as at least with international acceptance um, in many other areas, such as acoustic data, uh, say for bio, um, um, like bioacoustic data for zoom plankton, or um, these more recent developments of cameras that can image uh, zooplankton. 
Um, so common standardized approaches to these kind of newer emerging instruments are needed, as well as ways of annotating, um, say from uh, passive acoustics uh, for underwater hydrophones for uh, the species or, or the different sounds that are heard in the ocean. So there's many, many different uh, types of data that we like to start to incorporate beyond what we can currently do with the physical ocean variables that are a little bit more established. Um, in the broader ocean community. Um, and so we, we have to maintain um, uh, our efforts on engaging with these more emerging standard works that are going on, as well as um, we need to be mindful that um, in Canada, there's some variables that would like to be a part of, the, that, that we know that partners would like to be included in CEUSE um, that are not necessarily recognized as essential ocean variables at the global ocean observing system. Um, and so we need to kind of think about uh, you know, do we go in the directions uh, that are even a little bit more um, emerging than what the broader oceanographic global community has uh, defined standards for? So uh, these are topics that we're actively discussing all the time. Thank you. And the next question, do you currently work under any standards when handling sensitive data? Uh, I, I can briefly try and answer this one as well. So um, as I mentioned, we're not actually offering uh, sensitive data quite yet, um, but we do have a number of cases at our individual repositories um, and data partners that we're starting to work with that are uh, sensitive data. So um, we're definitely going to be becoming more versed on, uh, well, a number of us have done the training on the First Nations OCAP, as well as we're looking at other um, traditional knowledge uh, labeling standards that are um, in practice. So we're, we're doing this evaluation currently. Um, so for those sensitive data types, um, and then in terms of how we represent those sensitive data, we're looking at within the metadata profile, um, there is a section where you can um, describe any kind of restrictions of data and whatnot. So we're, um, there's terminology and codes within that are like built into ISO 1915, um, but also um, um, we're looking at additional practices that, um, for example, in the medical community, they have um, defined uh, ways to articulate the different reasons for restricted data. So while ISO 1905, you can say it is restricted, but to add a little bit more definition about why it's restricted or restricted in what way, um, there's, there's definitely labeling we can take from some of the indigenous work that's out there, as well as some work that the medical community has kind of led. So just a little bit of a, a note, just following up on some of the other Q and A's. I know that they've been answered, but just for the reporting, um, there was a question about where can I get a copy of your standards? They couldn't find them on your site. Uh, so Rita, you responded and just provided the GitHub link, and we'll make sure that that link is also provided in the in the follow up in terms of it. We can include those references in our follow up email. An additional. Um, question also asking is there any discussion on possibly possibly explain expanding into into including arctic ocean data as well there's early discussions um, we are still in a phased approach so it's uh, it's obviously uh, top of our mind to expand this to other ocean regions uh, including the arctic but uh, we're just in this phased approach at this time. So would anyone add anything further to that? Uh, I know we, we are um, in discussion with, uh, um, yeah, with uh, CCADI, I believe is the organization that's already got quite a bit of Arctic data. Um, so, you know, we have contacts uh, with, w within that group that, um, we're starting to work with to look at the kind of data that they have and and obviously specifically ocean data uh, i know they have a wide range so um that that might be a starting point but uh, uh for now you know there is as lydia mentioned that talk of an arctic node eventually but uh, that's still um yeah definitely not in phase two but uh, uh some uh, possibly yeah we'll see maybe phase three <laughs> And for our final question, how might uh, CUs be looking to work with classic ocean data resources, uh, gc.ca sites like DFO, uh, 
ISDM, meds, bio, CHS, and how they are managing their data and tools and for people that uh, to find and submit their wave, current water properties, et cetera, data both historical as well as new data going forward. Yeah, I, I can start to answer this one. So we're actively, uh, DFO is an active participant in all of our working groups that we have nationwide. So we have representatives from DFO that are participating and, and helping us guide our processes as well as contributing data into the system already. Um, we're obviously looking to widen the scope uh, continually through this next phase. Um, so that, that includes the different, um, within DFO that includes the ISDM and, and the BIO and the IOS and the different um, arms um, within the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, when you uh, refer to the Canadian Hydrographic Service, at this point, um, bathymetric, bathymetric data is not one of the variables that we're including, um, but that's something that we might look at more to with Canadian Hydro Hydrographic Service in the past. Um, just historically leading into these, I know we're, we've gone through the first phase and now in the second phase, but even preliminary to that, we had a series of investigative evaluations as to what CS would look like. And so all along in this process, we've had representatives from DFO, um, from CHS, also from uh, the uh, Defense Research Development Canada. So we've had these uh, federal members of the federal family as active participants in the process as we've gone along. And so. Um, they're pretty much well informed as, as we're moving forward and are part of the process. And certainly if there's any, any interested parties to, to just send any one of us an email to start that conversation uh, in your regional association. Um, Raina mentioned that we've been working very closely with DFO as, as a family, but uh, we'd certainly welcome any uh, individual employee to come forward and, and start that discussion on their own. There was another uh, ch question in the chat function from DFO actually, and they just wanted to clarify the name of the server that we use. For the data or the metadata? It was during your uh, challenges um, slide. It was way, it was embedded in the chat. So I just wanna make sure we answer uh, the name of the server just says name of that server again, please. Okay, well, the metadata one is CKAN, uh, C-K-A-N, and the data one is ERDAP, E-R-D-D-A-P. Uh, so the, the person who's uh, registered under DFO, you do have permission to speak if you'd like to clarify. So you just need to unmute yourself. Oh, okay. They were asking about the vocabulary server. So they, they um, I see that question. So it's the NERC NERC uh, 2.0. Uh, yeah. So if you look, if you Google NERC 2.0 vocabulary server, you'll see this list of vocabularies. It's also available through the, um, the link that I sent for GitHub where we list the controlled vocabularies in practice. And so the links to the individual vocabularies that we're using from the NERC 2.0 server are available on that wiki. Thank you. So that concludes our webinar today. I do thank everyone for attending. I thank Jeff, Raina, and Lydia for their great presentation today. Uh, for those that are interested, you will receive a link to today's recording as well as a copy of the slides. And of course, if you have any questions, I do encourage you to get in touch with today's presenters. Thank you very much. Thanks, Melanie. Thank you. Take care.